They say that life is a highway, but Brandon Swanson unfortunately took the back roads. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. Nestled in southwestern Minnesota, below the Minnesota River, Lyon County is a rural area with about 25,000 residents. And looking at a map, you'll notice that most of the county is divided into one square mile plots of farmland. These are interspersed, of course, by small population centers, most of them running along major highways like Route 68. And Minnesota Route 68 connects two towns. Those are Canby and Marshall. Of course, there are more along the way, but those are the ones that are significant for today's story. And speaking of stories, I've got some updates for you on how my Bigfoot hunt has been going. As you know, I've been trying to communicate, to understand our brothers in the woods. But every time I've tried to do that, every attempt to communicate has ended with personal injury. But I looked Bigfoot up online, and he was surprisingly easy to find over on LinkedIn. But more importantly, it turns out he's got a daughter my age. So I thought to myself, Aiden, if just simply confronting Bigfoot has led to you breaking multiple bones, perhaps wooing his daughter and becoming part of the family is the way to earn his trust. And if I'm gonna woo my way into Bigfoot's family, I'm gonna have to smell great. And that is why we have partnered with Scentbird to get you 55% off your first month. Scentbird is a subscription fragrance service providing colognes, perfumes, and unisex fragrances from some of your favorite brands like Prada, Versace, Skylar, Confessions of a Rebel, and many more. Members receive a 30-day supply of their chosen fragrance every month, so you're never surprised as to what you're getting. And best of all, Scentbird is only $17 a month, meaning that you can try out different fragrances, colognes, perfumes, before you go and spend hundreds of dollars on a bottle of the one you really like. I was pretty nervous about my date with Bigfoot's daughter, but this bottle with a name that is French that I can't pronounce gave me all of the confidence that I needed. It looks and smells quite fancy. I simply don't speak this language. It's just got that subtle masculine scent that female Sasquatches really go crazy for. And if you want to smell as good as me, and Aiden, how good do I smell? Heavenly. Exactly. If you want to smell as good as I do, you can use our code, the Lore Lodge, for 55% off your first month of Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for that first month, and it's available anywhere in the US and Canada. This month, they sent me three cents to try out, and if you're like me and you have no idea how to pronounce these names, it's great because you can try out a bunch of different stuff. I like to smell good, I just don't know what I'm doing. My favorite was what I'm assuming is pronounced as Tuman Chill, nice refreshing clean scent to it. They also sent me this perfume from Brioni, which is muted, but it's nice and comforting. And despite the fact that I think this should be pronounced dime, I'm guessing it's not, but they sent me this as well, and if I were to be invited to some sort of like red carpet event, this is probably what I'd go with. Once again, you can use our code, the Lore Lodge, for 55% off your first month, and you can click the link below in the description or the pinned comment to find it. But before you had Scentbird or Leone County or even the concept of the state of Minnesota, the area was inhabited by the Eastern Dakota peoples. The Dakota were a Siouan language speaking people who originally inhabited all the way into northern Minnesota and the Great Lakes region, but during the 18th century they were pushed further southwest by a war with the Ojibwa. But despite these losses in the northeastern corner of their territory, the Dakota maintained a strong trade empire, which they protected through military force. They were accomplished trappers and hunters, relying on bison to get them through the summers, and then trapping beaver and other small game during the winter. Minnesota, being a land of many, 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 many lakes, and rivers was an ideal place for beaver trapping. Having survived a smallpox epidemic in larger numbers than their agricultural sedentary neighbors, the Hidasta and Mandan tribes, the Dakota were able to establish dominance over the region. Their nomadic lifestyle had allowed them to survive at a much greater rate. By the 1800s, the Dakota were arguably the most powerful tribe on the Great Plains, even able to control the flow of trade against Spanish and French merchants who were trying to come into the region. And even as American expansion and the Lewis and Clark expedition passed through the area in 1804, the Dakota continued to broaden their power. Seeing the writing on the wall, a shrewd Dakota chieftain by the name of Struck by the Re organized a trip to Washington, D.C. in 1857 to broker a treaty with the United States government. He's reported to have said, The white men are coming like maggots. It is useless to resist them. They are many more than we are. We could not hope to stop them. Many of our brave warriors would be killed, our women and children left in sorrow, and still we would not stop them. We must accept it and agree to the best terms we can get and adopt their ways. 
As a result of this delegation that was sent to Washington, a treaty was signed which allocated 11.5 million acres of land to the United States in exchange for $1.6 million paid to the Dakota over 50 years, as well as education in agriculture, industry, and homemaking, as well as 475,000 acres of reservation territory on the north side of the Missouri. That 50-year $1.6 million annuity in today's dollars would be worth $55,326,896 today. The treaty was ratified in 1859, with Minnesota becoming a state the year prior. Pretty much immediately there were issues, as between 1850 and 1860, the settler population ballooned from just 6,000 people to 172,000 people. On top of that, the Dakota suffered poor harvests, a very harsh winter in 1861, and then the United States failed to hold up its end and deliver the annuity payments in time. As a result of this, merchants from France, Spain, and just the other territories around started to wonder if the Dakota would be able to pay their promised debts, which they had made agreements based on the United States promising this money. All of this coalesced into armed conflict in 1862, what was called the Dakota War. Essentially, the United States played stupid games and won stupid prizes, as on August 17th, 1862, the Dakota struck the first blow. Four Dakota hunters came across five white settlers, and as far as we know, according to one of the Dakota chiefs, they actually are the ones who made the decision to attack. Now, there was a lot of factionalism within the Dakota. Some of them wanted to wait on the treaty, and some of them wanted to go to war. So, unfortunately, war was the option that ended up being chosen. To be clear, the attack was not planned or sanctioned by any Dakota leadership. It was just a heat-of-the-moment thing from these four men. The non-unanimous nature of the war effort notwithstanding, it did begin in earnest the next day. Initially, the Dakota had the better of the fighting because the United States was slow to mobilize due to the war against the South. At the time, the Confederacy was still on the offensive, and it would be nearly a year until the tide-turning battles at Gettysburg and Vicksburg. However, eventually, an American army, complete with infantry, cavalry, artillery, did show up, and the Dakota simply could not match that. The army under the command of Colonel Henry Hastings Sibley defeated the army under the command of Chief Little Crow at the Battle of Wood Lake on September 23, 1862, ending the Dakota War. This resulted in the abolition of the Dakota Reservation and the annulment of the treaty signed just a few years prior. Not long after this, the area today known as Leon County was organized. Primarily agricultural, the area is bisected by the Yellow Medicine River, which is a tributary of the Minnesota. As I previously mentioned, most of the transit between population centers is done on very straight state roads like Minnesota State Route 68, a route that, had Brandon Swanson taken it, probably would have saved his life. On May 13th, 2008, Brandon's freshman year at Minnesota West Technical and Community College ended, and, as one does at the end of the year, he decided to go out and just go to some parties with his friends, hang out in some backyards. It was May, the weather was nice. And Brandon didn't live far away. He was a graduate of Marshall High School in the small town of Marshall, Minnesota, just 30 minutes to the southeast, where he lived with his parents. Brandon was a relatively small individual. He was only five foot six and 120 pounds with curly brown hair and blue eyes. That's relevant because while celebrating in Canby, Brandon is believed to have been drinking, though everyone said that he didn't appear drunk or even inebriated, just he had had a few beers. However, for a person that size and that young, that can be a little bit more intense than for somebody who's a little bit older and bigger. Brandon left Canby at about midnight to head home, and had he taken Route 68, he would have got there by 1 a.m. at the very latest. Now, Brandon may have started his trip home on Route 68, but he ended up driving on gravel and dirt rural back roads at some point. Sometime after midnight, Brandon called his parents to inform them that he had accidentally driven his car off the road into a ditch, and he needed them to come pick him up. According to Brandon, he had crashed somewhere between Marshall and Lind, with Lind being a small town just seven miles southwest of his home. His mother and father quickly got into the car and headed towards the area where Brandon was absolutely positive he was. Despite that certainty, his parents, Brian and Annette Swanson, could not find him. They drove back and forth, up and down, flashing their headlights, him flashing his headlights. They could hear the sound of his headlights clicking on and off over the phone, and they just could not find Brandon. At one point, they became frustrated. Brandon hung up the phone. They called him back, and he decided, you know what? I'm going to start walking, and I will meet my dad in Lind. I have a friend who lives there. His dad said, sure, how about you go to the Lindwood Lounge, and I will pick you up there. It was a bar. He figured, you know what? This is the best spot to go to. It's a well-known hangout. 
It seems that Brian went home, dropped off Annette, and then went back to the Lindwood Lounge to wait for his son. They made a few different phone calls here and there, describing where they were, what was going on, and then at around 2.35 in the morning, Brandon called his father and stayed on the phone with him. He mentioned that he was crossing through a field and that there were fences and the sound of running water nearby. Now this makes sense because Lind is surrounded by farmland and the Redwood River runs right through the western side of town. As well, about three and three quarter miles to the west, another river, the Three Mile Creek, runs through several farms. Brandon was walking and talking and sounding fine until at exactly 3.10 a.m. he yelled, oh shit, and the line just kind of went, went silent. Now he didn't hang up the phone, his father tried to get him to respond, and then ended up hanging up and calling the phone back. The phone would ring, it would go to voicemail, nothing. At this point, the nerves started to set in. Where was Brandon? Why had he gone silent? What was happening? And they looked for him, but at 6.30 a.m., after hearing and seeing nothing of their son, Brian and Annette decided to call the police. However, back in 2008, with the way the law worked, the police took down the information and then simply told Brian and Annette that at Brandon's age, he had a quote-unquote right to be missing and that they had to file a police report 24 hours after he had disappeared. Now, of course, this was not what the Swansons wanted to hear, and somehow they were able to get a hold of the sheriff who was able to launch a search before 24 hours. They were able to use Brandon's phone records to locate his last known position, which was not Lind. In fact, he was nowhere even close to Lind. He was 19 miles away from Marshall itself, and they located his car around 12.30 p.m. He ended up on 390th Street outside of the small town of Taunton, where it intersects with Leon Lincoln County Road, the county line. This is about 13 miles southeast of where he had started in Canby. And on top of all of that, this intersection where he went off the road is just one mile north of Route 68. It's uncertain how the car ended up in the ditch. Maybe Brian had fallen asleep at the wheel as it was late at night, maybe he had swerved to avoid something, and others suggested maybe he was more under the influence than it was previously thought. There's conflicting information on this part, but it seems that by the time they launched the search, Brandon's phone was sending calls directly to voicemail. Although one account from several years later says that they were calling the phone and it was ringing, then going to voicemail. The search initially focused on the immediate vicinity of the car. Brandon had mentioned Lind and said he was going to be walking towards it. Now, he must have thought that one of the, the local small towns was the one he was intending to go to. But from where he was, there were only two within walking distance. To the northwest was Porter, about just under four miles away, and then to the southeast, much closer, less than two miles away, was Taunton. And from where Brandon would have been standing, he should have been able to see a grain elevator, the red light up at the top of it, in Taunton. And if he had seen that, maybe he thought it was Lind, so he decided to go there. Now, taking the shortest route towards Lind meant crossing the Yellow Medicine River as well as a couple of fields. Now, that night, the Yellow Medicine River was flowing unusually high and fast, up to 15 feet deep in some places. However, the river is only about 20 feet wide. While less than 20 feet wide at the point nearest to the crash, it was still pretty cold and fast. Initially, dogs led investigators from the car to a gravel road and then immediately lost the scent. This is not unusual, as gravel roads are much more prone to wind and dust, and being driven on can kick up dirt in a way that it just won't on, you know, grass or asphalt. This complicated things because police could not determine which direction Brandon had walked. He was clearly walking, and walking for about 45 minutes, but they didn't know where. All they knew was he thought he was going towards a town. Because they couldn't determine where he could have been, they couldn't really structure a search. They just had to keep looking for, you know, a start to the trail. Dogs did eventually pick up that trail, but it went the wrong direction. They expected that he was going towards Taunton, which he could have seen. He said he could see Lind, he probably meant Taunton, but the dogs led west towards Porter, about a mile and a quarter. Throughout Thursday, the 16th of May, 2008, police and other investigators searched on ATVs, horseback, and with light aircraft. Unfortunately, none of this produced any further clues. However, that dog team had led them about a mile and a quarter west down into the river, up the other side, and to a gravel road, which led them nearby to an abandoned farm. With the dogs now focusing on North Branch Yellow Medicine River, they decided to search there. And Sheriff Jack Vizecki of Lincoln County, working in tandem with Leon County Sheriff Joel Dahl, walked that stretch of the Yellow Medicine River every day for 30 days himself. 
along with help, but what they were doing was looking for any of Brandon's belongings that might have washed up on the banks or gotten stuck on a tree branch or even a full body to, you know, be somewhere. They had also put gates into the river further down to stop anything from flowing out into the Minnesota. There was no trace of Brandon in that river. Due to the lack of a body, Sheriff Fizeki, as well as Brandon's mother, Annette, began to wonder if it was really likely that Brandon had gotten sunken into the river, had drowned. You know, it seemed more likely that if he wasn't there, he must have gotten back out. And of course, the dog did lead to the other side of the river. Vizeki also noted that there was a possibility of a kidnapping, but there was no evidence of foul play, so it was hard to tell. And that claim about the abandoned farm comes from a 2010 CNN article, but I was able to confirm that with the Leon County Sheriff's Department. So that is a, a true statement that is legitimate. And throughout the 30 days after Brandon went missing, Sheriff Vizeki, other searchers, and cadaver dogs all were looking. And cadaver dogs work a little bit differently than bloodhounds. They're not trying to track something that's alive. They are simply trained to smell bodies. So, if Brandon's body was in the area, they should have been able to smell it on the wind, and they didn't find anything. Of course, while Vizeki himself was searching for a full 30 days, the official organized search ended just six days after Brandon was reported missing. This, of course, did not halt efforts, as we're talking about a pretty small community where everybody knows each other, and people just wanted to find Brandon. They wanted to bring closure to the Swanson family, whether that meant finding Brandon alive or giving the family a body to bury. One of those people who decided to help out of the goodness of their heart was David Francis, whose own son had gone missing in 2006. David joined around Memorial Day, bringing with him the resources of the John Francis Foundation, named after his son who went missing in the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho back in 2006. These extra resources allowed the search to go on in a more intensive manner than usual for much longer. However, they weren't really able to make any ground, and eventually later that year, the search was handed off to Emergency Support Services. Emergency Support Services Search and Rescue is a private group who handles cases like this where law enforcement doesn't have the resources or the evidence or the time to further investigate, so they go in and they work alongside police as sort of a surrogate to go and try and find clues so that law enforcement itself can then go in and do their job. But as the search progressed, they ended up hitting a roadblock. According to the Grand Forks Herald, a lot of farmers in the area bristled at the idea of having canines and search teams on their property. Now, most of these were cattle farmers, and the reasoning given was that it, the dogs were unfamiliar and the people were unfamiliar, and they might end up scaring the cattle, and of course, scaring the cattle is not good for the cattle, it's not good for the farmer, it's not good for the farm, they can lose money. So, a lot of these people wanted to see warrants before they allowed anybody to search their property. And because ESS works with law enforcement but is not itself law enforcement, they could not get those warrants. They had to go to the police and the police needed probable cause. And a farmer saying, no, you can't be on my property, simply doesn't apply. Now, of course, the vast majority of farmers did intend to help. And they did say, you can search my property. But the search area was about 140 square miles. So there were farmers who were very far from where Brandon went missing, who simply didn't see it as possible that Brandon was on their property and didn't want people tramping over their crops and scaring their livestock. Now, of course, the fact that people said, no, you can't search my property led to a number of conspiracy theories. These theories alleged that perhaps a farmer was responsible for Brandon's disappearance. Maybe he was kidnapped or murdered or that he, you know, fell asleep in a field and got run over by a tractor. That one seems unlikely. But considering that it's multiple farmers across 140 square mile area, it seems unlikely that this was the case. If it were just one farmer out of all of them, there might be a little suspicion, but there's kind of a pattern here of people who have legitimate excuses. Now, of course, at this point in the story, we're several years on. There had been multiple organized searches over several years that were looking for Brandon, trying to find new clues. In fact, one of this is, this is one of the longest running organized searches in American history. In 2013, another full search was launched, which took 120 days with more than 500 volunteers, including 34 dog teams from nine states, and these people searched a 120 mile square area. With that many people and that many dog teams, you would expect that something would be found but they came up empty handed. But even in 2015, emergency support services was still picking up scent trails and pockets that led them to think, you know, maybe we found Brandon, but they just couldn't find anything definitive. And as dozens of tips came in over the years, a lot of them were investigated, especially when they were unique and not just repeats of an old one, but nothing was ever found. 
Not his cell phone, not his keys, not his clothes. There is no trace of Brandon Swanson. Well into the 2010s, ESS continued to search, and to this day, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension keeps an open case file. Of course, due to the fact that this is an open case file, I was only able to get so much in the way of information without filing a FOIA request. Now, though Brandon was never found, his family has not given up hope of finding at least his remains, of having some closure. They don't think that he's still alive, but they do still leave their porch light on just in case he comes home, and they've been doing that since 2008. While they couldn't help Brandon anymore, they did take his case and turn it into something good. They found a silver lining. And that silver lining is Brandon's Law, which was enacted in Minnesota in July of 2009. Now, what Brandon's Law says is that no matter the age of the person who disappeared, if the police receive a missing person's complaint, they must immediately begin to investigate it. No waiting 24 hours because it's an adult. This could be a 65-year-old, it could be a 20-year-old, it could be a 10-year-old. It does not matter. The police in Minnesota are required to investigate. And Brandon's Law was actually adopted by multiple states across the country. So this horrific tragedy did have some good spring out of it. With the lack of any physical evidence regarding what happened to Brandon, where he went, where he ended up, there's only really been the opportunity for people to have theories about what happened to him. Some of them are rather legitimate sounding, and some are really not. One of them, of course, is alien abduction, which I'll get to later, but I think it's important to go through why some of them seem possible and why some just don't add up. There's of course a theory that the farmers of the area either conspired to cover up his death, that somebody kidnapped him, that he was run over by some farm equipment. One suggestion was that a farmer was plowing and Brandon was laying in the field, either dead or, you know, barely alive, and went over his body, freaked out, decided to hide the evidence and all of that. The problem is, it was too late in the season for them to be tilling the fields with machinery, and it was too early in the season for them to be harvesting. So there's no real reason why Brandon would have ended up under the treads of something. And that time of year, there's not enough height to the crops that you're gonna see, you know, that you're gonna obscure a body. He would have just been visible laying there on the ground. Also, most of the farms that denied the ESS searchers the ability to even look on the property weren't agriculture, or not agriculture, they, they were they were cattle farms is what I'm trying to say. So the idea that it would be a, a tilling accident doesn't make a ton of sense. Maybe if you were looking at like a pig farm where pigs are known to eat everything, that might do it. But even then, it's there, there's no evidence that something like that happened. Cattle are simply fearful of unfamiliar dogs, so it makes sense that cattle farmers wouldn't want unfamiliar dogs on their property. And even if it were a non-cattle farm, if it were just crops, a large search team, dogs, they could disrupt the equipment, they could disrupt the crops, they could trample stuff, the farmers lose money, they lose time. It's understandable why farmers outside of the immediate vicinity where Brandon went missing would not consent to their property being searched. And of course, there were numerous farms that denied it. If it were every farm said yes, and then one said no, then there's a little bit of a reason to be suspicious, but that wasn't the case. Of course, there's also the issue of the abandoned farm, which has been brought up by a few different sources. A number of sites mention the fact that there was an abandoned farm nearby where the dogs led investigators, that maybe Brandon fell into the river, got wet, climbed out, and then tried to look for help at the farm, but succumbed to exposure because it got down to 39 degrees that night, he was wet, and maybe he became hypothermic. It does make sense to an extent because Brandon was tracked by dogs about a mile and a quarter west of where his car crashed. I did confirm that with the sheriff's department, but they also found nothing of Brandon's. The cadaver dogs didn't find anything, the bloodhounds didn't find anything, and they used the abandoned farm as a base of operations for the rest of the search. That said, there are several routes he could have taken, one of which does cut through a field, as he mentioned he was doing, does cross the river, as the dogs indicate he did, and does lead, within that mile and a quarter, to a gravel road very close to that abandoned farm. However, it's also important to note that the Leon County Sheriff's Department told me that they never established a definitive direction of travel for Brandon after the crash. The dogs indicated that he went west, but they ended up losing the scent trail, and there was nothing to suggest that he was there other than the scent, so they don't consider that to be definitive. Now, of course, there's the possibility that he didn't make it out of the river, so why is that unlikely? Well, simply put, all law enforcement said his body should have washed up somewhere, that it shouldn't have made it all the way to the Minnesota, and that somewhere along that Yellow Medicine River, 
he should have been found. It's only knee deep in some places, and there's logs and rocks, and it's not a very wide river either. On top of that, there were gates installed further down to make sure that if Brandon did end up traveling downstream, he would be stopped by one of these gates. Obviously, nothing came of those gates. So, due to the lack of information around where Brandon actually walked, it's not surprising that there hasn't been a ton of movement on this case and that nothing was ever found of him. He could have gone in a direction completely separate from anything they looked at, but at the same time, he must have been going in one of two directions, either southeast or northwest, because he thought he was going towards a town. And the only two towns located near him were about two miles to the southeast and about four miles to the northwest. And on top of all of that, a lot of the difficulty in researching this case was the conflicting reports that I found. There was very little official police information available because it's still an open case. So I was able to kind of put together what I think the narrative is for the exact time period during which Brandon was on the phone with his parents and then went missing. Some say that it was shortly after midnight and others say it was at 1.54 a.m. that he initially called his parents. It's, it's hard to say, so we're, we're going to place that 47-minute phone call in the chronology. And oddly enough, the best source to do that, and this is probably the only time that CNN has ever done something right, but CNN gets it right, I think. And here's how I think it went. Brandon left the party in Canby sometime shortly before or after midnight. He then called sometime between midnight and 1 a.m. for help. That is when he crashed the car. At about 1.55 a.m., they agreed to meet at the Lindwood Lounge. It's mentioned that they exchanged a few more calls here and there, and then around 2.35 a.m., it seems that Brandon called his father, Brian, to talk to him as he walked to Lind. 47 minutes into that phone call, around 3.10 a.m., Brandon said, oh shit, dropped the phone, and did not say anything else or pick up. From that point, we know absolutely nothing about what happened to Brandon. And while it was late and dark, Anyone who's ever been near a creek or river of that size knows that you can hear it before you see it, before you're actually on top of it. So it seems really unlikely to me, given that it was three in the morning, it was probably almost completely silent out there aside from the sounds of insects, Brandon should have heard the creek. And on top of that, it's, you know, it was moving pretty fast, it was up high, he should have known he was approaching it. So. If he went into it, it must have been on purpose. And then there's possibly the biggest question of all of this, which is, how did he get where he was, and why did he think he was where he wasn't? Now, how he got where he was is the less mysterious of the questions. Looking at a map, you would think that he would take the same route that he took getting to and from school. He would get onto Route 68 and just head straight southeast home. That would have taken him directly from Canby to Marshall. It is the fastest way to go. It is the safest way to go. It is also the best paved road in the area. Thing is, Brandon may have been trying to avoid police. Everyone who was with him, as well as people who talked to him on the phone, like his dad, said that he seemed completely coherent and like he was not drunk at all. And typically, if you have a blood alcohol content under 0.08%, you're not going to get in trouble with the police. They might, I mean, they can still get you. They still can. They can arrest you for drinking, for driving under the influence with a BAC of 0.08, but they, they're probably only going to do that if you have prior DUIs or if you're being a jerk. Now, Brandon was a minor, and on top of that, Brandon had a DUI from two years earlier. At that time, he was convicted of a fourth degree misdemeanor drinking and driving, basically a DUI. So that's a small fine and community service because it's a first offense and he was a minor. In this case, He's now over the age of 18, he was 17 for the first one, so he's now an adult, he would be on his second DUI offense, and that carries much harsher penalties. So he may have taken back roads as a precaution to avoid police just in case he did get pulled over. The thing is, that still leaves a few questions, because where he was is nowhere near Lind. Not only is he miles away, like 25 miles away from Lind, but no matter which route he took, he should have known that he was not near Lind. Reports suggest that he was driving east on 390th Street, just outside of Taunton, which was about two miles to the southeast. The crash then would have occurred as he crossed Leon Lincoln County Road, that is the county line, into Leon County on 390th. The problem with that is that 390th starts just a block west of where he crashed. So, at some point, he had to turn onto 390th. 
Here's the issue. Had he gone south out of Canby and then east and then swung north to get where he ended up crashing, he would have had to cross Route 68 between Porter and Taunton. Thing is, Route 68 does not pass through Lind at any point. Lind is miles south of Route 68. So if he crossed Route 68, he would have known he was way north of Lind. If he were coming from the north, he would have taken the final turnoff before hitting 68, matching the theory that he was trying to avoid 68 to avoid the police, but he also would have known then that he was north of Route 68, and therefore nowhere near Lind. Now, of course, of the two, the idea that he headed east out of Canby and then south towards Taunton is the, the more believable. In this case, the most direct route would have been taking either 230th, 220th, or 210th Avenue out of Canby to the east, and then heading south on one of the other farm roads that leads, you know, miles and miles and miles until you get where he crashed. Or maybe he was zigzagging on these grids of country roads. We don't know particularly what his trip looked like, but it does seem more likely that he was coming from the north. At some point, he then would have crossed Leon Lincoln County Road and should have known crossing that road, seeing that road sign, that, that, that 390th Leon Lincoln, he should have known at that point that he was on the county line. Once again, nowhere near Lind. And then again, on top of that, 390th is 16 miles north of Lind, and it's in the 300s. All of the roads in Lind that head the same way are in the 200s. In every single circumstance, all of his surroundings, all of his landmarks, told him he was not near Lind. Even if he took back roads and intended to take them the whole way home, there is absolutely no way that he made that mistake. And then there's the scent trail, which of course the sheriff's department told me, and I will quote for you, there has been no definitive direction of travel established, and there has never been any evidence recovered to indicate that the abandoned farm is of any more key importance than any other in this case. So just to be clear on that one, that this is not a definitive thing, but that is the only scent trail that they were able to trace. So if Brandon's intention was to walk toward Lind, the closest town to him, why didn't he walk towards Taunton? Why turn and go west? Which again, he, was, he should have known he was traveling east. So why turn and go west towards Porter? Neither town is visible from where he crashed, though there is a light on top of a grain elevator in Taunton that you can see. Nothing like that is visible from Porter. There's no grain tower you can see, there's no cell towers. Maybe a little bit of light pollution was confusing him, but then there would have been light pollution from Taunton as well. So the question in this case isn't, was Brandon's disappearance impossible? Was it totally odd on its face? The question is, why hasn't anything been found? Because if Brandon fell into that river and succumbed to hypothermia, his body would have been somewhere nearby. Or if Brandon had continued walking, could he really have gotten far enough outside of the search area? Yeah, but then he would have known he was outside of the search area. So Brandon must have died somewhere in that general area and nobody found anything. Cadaver dogs can sense up to 15 feet underground. They can also smell for miles from what I understand. So it makes no sense that Brandon underwent the series of things that we know he underwent and didn't turn up somewhere. There is the possibility that he disappeared of his own volition, but on the other hand, nobody thought he had any reason to do that. He had displayed no signs that he wanted to walk away from his life. So why would he do it? And then finally, there's the alien abduction theory, which I saved for last because there's no evidence that he was abducted by aliens, aside from the fact that his body's not there. I don't know what else to say. Also, a lot of alien abduction stories, usually the person comes back, it seems like. Well, I guess you, I guess you couldn't say for sure, because if they got abducted and didn't come back, they wouldn't be able to tell you. Anyway, I think aliens are unlikely here. But what I think is unlikely doesn't totally matter, because there are a couple hundred thousand of you, so let us know what you guys think in the comments. If you think that this was foul play, if you think that Brandon got washed away by the river, we're curious to know, because there have been times where people have commented something we didn't catch, and it's kind of been a, oh, you know what, maybe that's it kind of moment. So, if you have theories and thoughts, please do not hesitate to let us know in the comments. I also want to give a special thank you to Scentbird for sponsoring this video. If you want to try out their products, that would really help us out, and you can do that by clicking the link below.
You can also check out our merch shop at thelorelodge.shop where you can get nice fun materials. And if you wanna check out our coffee from Tableau Roasting Company, Mount Pocono Perk, you can do that on tableauroastingco.com uh, under their collaborations tab. This is tasty, it's nice. I was a barista for a very long time. I know what I'm doing. It's delicious. I had it tested by other coffee roasters. Good, good stuff. Smells almost as good as the Scentbird stuff. We also have an Amazon store where you can check out our preferred books, movies, materials. If you want to start streaming yourself, we've got that. You can check that out there. It is in the links below. You can become a member of this channel to help us out with our you know, funding and whatnot, or you can check us out over on Patreon, where we are, The War Lodge. You can check out some uh, exclusive content, some me drunkenly ranting about you know various folkloric items, and some of the tiers get you like a hoodie or something, so that's nice. And if you want to catch what we do here on the channel live, you can check that out every Sunday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And with that said, I am Aiden Mattis, and thank you for stopping by the War Lodge.